Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. This is Gerard Yuseli speaking. We are on episode 15. And let me say, doing this gives any perception of having anybody from all walks of life to be involved with this platform. And anyone can relate to change. And it's so insane to me how we could all really come together as one. And this is a prime example of so because this person I met through a membership group called Ivy. And it's been about three years since I've seen her, but I will say the pandemic has brought us closer together. I have my next guest with me, Alicia Fawcett. Alicia, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invite and I'm looking forward to hang out with you here on the Change Within podcast. Absolutely. Well, that sounds great. And we'll get right into it. So something I'm always curious about for you or any other guests that I have is what your childhood was like growing up. Yeah, that's a great question. I was a very strange kid. I mean, I kind of had my own world in my own mind and was kind of living in another place. Um, growing up, I, I like to play with with kids, but I also was like creating musicals and, and ideas and I was in different worlds. And it's very strange yet sometimes I catch myself back in these worlds as an adult. So, and especially right now. So you wanted to be the main character of your own story. Exactly. Um, I, I wanted to travel within my own mind and be in different places. And um, eventually I grew up and had the opportunity to travel around the world, which was really great. But that started at a young age, believe it or not. Absolutely. And then from that point, like having that traveling experience fr from a young age, what was it kind of like to tell stories to your friends, maybe within like your tween years? How was that level of understanding between people within your circle? Yeah. Um, I mean, telling stories between and when I was a teenager or as an adult was always interesting because as you learn and grow and you learn about yourself as a person and then the world around you the narrative continually changes and the narrator changes and so the story I was telling myself or my friends when I was younger is completely different than the story I'm telling today um, which I find fascinating how we evolve as humans and within our mind and our own story. So it's funny you say that because I'm a Virgo and it is kind of ironic that you mentioned that because there are things when you tell stories initially that you don't think of based on your audience that you tell it to and you reach into certain points and pick those pockets as far as how you engage with them. Exactly. I, I completely agree with you. I'm cancer, but I'm on the same page or I'm in the ocean as the crab. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely a sign to uh, definitely get ourselves immersed within more of your career at this point, because at that point, like what was kind of your first like incentive to like pursue cybersecurity? Like, did you kind of reach it more like a younger age? Like what was your first inclination? Yeah, you know, I had no idea I wanted to pursue cybersecurity. And honestly, when I was in college, cybersecurity didn't exist. Um, so it's funny that I ended up in this career because I was not planning on it. And I think that was great about change. I was constantly changing as an adult. Um, I made sure that I was open-minded and learning new things, picking up new skills. And I always wanted to pursue a career that was futuristic. So something in the future that would be created by the time I graduated college or went into the working world. And that's what happened, which is very exciting. I could have not predicted that, but I did set myself up in a way where I could reach that point, um, which is very important. However, I studied international relations. I have a master's degree in international economic relations. I um, worked at the State Department as an intern. I have also worked at the UN. I, I worked in a few other different fields before I landed in cybersecurity. But what's interesting about cybersecurity is I used all of those different skills from diplomacy to writing, to um, communicating and analysis, all of these skills that you would not traditionally think are useful for 
technology or cybersecurity, you, you, when you hear the word cyber, you think technical. But really, this field is not technical. Um, it is, but it, it's much more than that. And that's what I really enjoy and love about being in cybersecurity, unexpectedly. Well well, also in that regard too, so to think more futuristically and especially for you kind of coming into your own on this. So for anybody who tries to think forward, times can be very intimidating. Was there ever a point for yourself where you kind of went into an internship or a job and you were just like, wow, I would not expect this for anything. So like you had that feeling just to like jump in. Um. Yes. Yes. It was completely different. I mean, there were definitely times where I struggled and, and wondered, you know, is this the right career for me? Is this the right path uh, before I hit cyber? And I did an internship in cybersecurity and said, no way. I kind of wrote it off. I was like, no, there was all men. There was no women. So I didn't have many role models and didn't think that because I didn't have a technical background, that I could be successful in this field. And that was completely wrong. So I left cybersecurity. I went into more international relations, writing journalism, and then I came back actually. And um, so I also had a problem with change at that point because I wasn't open-minded enough to think that someone like me could have a technical cybersecurity career where you're utilizing you know, not so much technical skills, but all of these other skills that are so important in this field. So I, it, I completely failed in the beginning, for sure, not being open minded enough to continue into cyber and, and took a break in between. So kind of to like mesh both worlds of you, like, kind of imagining what life is like and being kind of futuristic in your own way as a kid and then versus going back and forth with those type of like career growths. Like, do you feel like the people around you kind of shared your interest? Um, I always thought I was a little bit more strange than other people around me. I loved post-apocalyptic books like 1984, The Giver. Um, I love these kind of it handmade, I read Handmaid's Tale in sixth grade. That was my favorite book, um, which is now, you know, like a huge kind of pop culture uh, book that everybody loves, Margaret Atwood. But I definitely saw more things happening before they happened than everyone else around me and uh, didn't know what to do with this. I had no idea. It was like some superpower that I had no clue how to really utilize that in my life um, to help and contribute to society and also, you know, to establish a career. And I feel like one of those like predicaments in that way is when people want you to go right, you go left. And one example of that is how you picked up learning Chinese throughout your career. What was kind of like your first steps in doing so? And how did you feel to kind of like get yourself through a language barrier growing up? That was really hard. Um, learning Chinese has to this day has been the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> like that language is crazy, but it's so great. Like you said, once you reach the barrier and you get over that barrier of learning this complicated language, it's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful to understand another language. The characters are magnificent because they're hieroglyphic based characters rooted in, in pictures and images. And so you can visually see uh, what the character means, which is so amazing. But I, the reason I started Chinese was because I'm a rebel. And I walked into my uh, counselor the first day of college and she said, what would you like to accomplish here in college? And I said, I would like to learn German and Chinese fluently. And she laughed at me and said, oh, ha, ha. no, there's no way you can do that. Like, just stick with like Spanish or something. Don't even try. And so I was determined. I was determined to learn Chinese and I went into the class. I felt completely like out of the kind of group of people that would learn Chinese um, and was just kind of shy, but 
started to connect with my teacher. And the reason why I'm doing anything I'm doing today is because of my Chinese teacher. She is this amazing person that believed in me, that believed that I could learn Chinese. And I think that's also important is to have those mentors that believe in you and finding them out, those mentors and those cheerleaders, the people that are cheering you on. You need both. Did you feel like it was more difficult to read or write it for Chinese? Ooh, that's a hard one. Definitely writing is tough, but with current technology, you can type pinyin. Sure. Is, yeah, which is in between, you know, the Latin alphabet and then the Chinese character. So I'm actually not writing as much in Chinese as I was taught in school. However, speaking is pretty complicated. You have um, four different tones. And if you say a tone incorrectly, then you're mispronouncing the word and it could mean something else. So um, you have to be very particular with the tone. And I'm, my Chinese teacher will tell you this. <laughs> I'm sure when you're trying to push yourself, gaffes come along the way. Do you have like any funny, quirky stories that come along with that as far as like when you were first starting to like express yourself towards like peers or coworkers at the time? Oh my gosh, yes. I So I arrived in China when I was 18. I lost all of my luggage. I didn't speak any Chinese. <laughs> this was the first foreign country I've ever been to in my life. And I arrived, I'm, I learned, I had like a year of Chinese, so I could kind of communicate, you know, and so I didn't have any clothes and I went to um, a market and the next day I had class, so I needed to buy some pants. So I went in and purchased um, a pair of pants, but I didn't understand the sizing. It was like a 32, you know, like double digit sizing. I wasn't, didn't really know what that meant. And I just bought these pants with my little Chinese that I knew. Um, I was like, well, yeah, quite so, which is like, I want some pants. She gave me some pants. And <laughs> the next day I put on the pants and they were huge. <laughs> I had to hold them up. <laughs> I had to hold them up around my, my body and walk into class with all of my peers. And I was like, I was pretty like shy, I didn't know anyone. And so I was like this girl with like holding, I had to hold my pants the entire day because I couldn't communicate in the language. And that really motivated me to learn Chinese <laughs> to survive. And I, and I think that was the thing was you need to understand other languages in order to communicate with people that are not from your culture or country, but. So funny I'm story. sure in that way, it was just, it was probably like a culture shock for them to be like, wow, this person has like pants, maybe three to four sizes too big for them. Exactly. I have no idea why they gave me these giant pants, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what happened. <laughs> so also like, do you feel like when you know another language other than English, do you feel like it's kind of like naturally easier for you to pick up? Because I, I did notice you, you do speak what, like seven or eight languages. I speak, I speak six now. So German, French, Italian, Spanish, Chinese. Am I missing one? English? <laughs> and I do speak a little Czech, but um, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a great speaker in the Czech language at all. But yeah, um, I love languages. They're so fun to learn. Um, I would like to learn Russian. That's that's my next one. I, I learn them for fun in my free time. Uh, once you learn that first language, it's so much easier to learn the rest. And because you know the process, and it's not the language itself, but you know what you need to do to learn the language. You know you have to make a fool out of yourself. You sound stupid usually when you're starting to, to learn a language. Um, you know, like a child, you when you begin to communicate, you make mistakes. Um, you get embarrassed. There's a lot of just memorization and practice that, that goes into it. And so it's definitely easier because you know what you're up against. Um, however, I've never learned a harder language than Chinese. I think Chinese is probably the hardest language I've ever attempted. 
Or- well, not to compare something so monetary in this case, but Kevin O'Leary said something very interesting on CNBC for Millennial Money. And this was something that kind of compelled me at the time when the pandemic was happening, where your first $1 million that anyone is desiring to make is your most difficult to do. When it gets to $5 million, he says that's even tougher. When you get to $10 million because of passive income, it gets a lot easier. Interesting. It's almost that hump that you have to reach. Yeah, like, it's it's really literally like a Himalaya it. up a hill and down it. Yes, and then you're just like back down and it's hard again. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's That's hope we both went to dead on that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We don't want to go there. We're just, we're just going to stay on top of the Himalaya mountain. <laughs> so as, as I'm sure you've had quite some years experience in the field, And just within a span of a few years, freedom of speech is always up for debate and things are always within a compromise, whether or not how people want to utilize it. So like, what does freedom of speech mean to you? And do you think change is essential to keep the principles strong? Yes, 100%. So I do um, write articles on disinformation and foreign affairs, uh, mainly from with China, having to do with China and other interference. So what's really important to me with freedom of speech is having accurate information, objective facts, um, information that is not emotionally driven, information that you are able to take into account and then understand and interpret it from your perspective. And that's so important and that that's so important for the future as well. Like I said, I'm a futurist. And so for me, this is what we need in order to move forward successfully as a society, uh, as a global community as well. And being able to combat disinformation or foreign interference, fake news, for example, that is threatening our freedom of speech. And it's so important for people to be able to understand the world and and what's happening in reality instead of an ideal. So um, yes, freedom of speech is is so important and we're losing it. We're losing the battle right now. So there's a lot that needs to be done to combat this. As a follow-up on this too. So as we all go into our ways of how we express ourselves, whether they're like fact-oriented or opinion-based, how do you consolidate research? Like, what are your steps to do research before you speak on anything that you do? That's a, gr- that's a great question. So when you're doing research, you should always be looking for primary source materials. That's the first step. So looking at, um, I like to go to academic articles. I go to the source. I always go to the source. It's like some sort of inception. I read one thing and then figure out where they got that thing from and then that thing and that thing. Now, if you don't have enough time to do that, which most people don't in their everyday life, unless they are researchers, I would look for information coming from sources that are reliable. So reliable institutions that don't have any other incentives um, nonprofits are great. I like to read news in different languages. So that's a benefit of mm, speaking. That's other interesting. Languages. So reading in French, um, I like to read Divella in German. Um, sometimes I read in Italian. I mean, that, that really helps to get different perspectives as well. So I think that's important to know where your news and your information is coming from. Academic journals are usually pretty sound. Do you think for the sense of debate when people do talk to you about different things and we're, we all go through this as people ourselves, do you feel like it's a lot easier based on how well researched you can be that you're able to pick out people who only source their information via social media? Yes, that's very important. And this is actually extremely effective because sources that are coming from or social media sources are using emotional language and like trigger words, um, relatability. There's a lot of psychological tricks that go into advertising information on social media, just like marketing. 
I mean, there's a famous story of um, in like the 1900s of marketing snake blood. And then we find out this guy was a millionaire and later on it was like things of water, you know? So you, you have to be careful in how you're getting your information marketed to you. Um, that's really important. And social media is usually not a good source to, you know, go to. Now, a lot of news um, outlets and academic journals, whatnot, do have social media. So following the right types of social media, it's almost like surrounding yourself with your with good friends. <laughs> I like to think of it this way. You are only you were only you because of the five or 10 people that you're around. There's some sort of quote like this, right? And I like to think of my news in the same way. I am who I am. I, I'm only the, as best as I am as a person with the amount of sources and quality of sources that surround me. I like to think of it like this. And, and social media, in my opinion, is not one of those good friends. Yeah, because yourself. ultimately like with those people, what gets what makes that expression so prevalent is the level of trust that it establishes between those different types of friends or sources that have built your credibility over time. Exactly. In that case, so kind of like to go off your like futuristic like talents in this way, like from when you first started in cybersecurity and to where you are now, how do you think the industry has changed and where do you see it going? Yeah. Um, wow. Cybersecurity is so interesting. I, everything is changing every day. I will get on my computer and there's a new cybersecurity law regulation. Um, there's new diplomacy between countries in, in terms of GDPR or NIST, which are cybersecurity laws, famous ones um, that I work with a lot. And then China um, especially is changing their cybersecurity laws weekly. So being on top of it and really knowing, you know, what are the new things that are happening? What hacks have happened overnight? Um, staying up to date, that's important. And honestly, I, I really can't predict where cybersecurity as a field is going. I know that it will be more important for our entire lives because data and personal information is basically who we are. And personal data on technology is an extension of our mind, of ourself. And so when somebody holds your personal data and information, it's almost like holding you captive in a way um, and getting to know you and your personality. There's just so much information online that this will be such an important field I think also we need to incorporate more women in this field as well. It's important for all of us to be in the cybersecurity conversation because protecting data and securing infrastructure, critical infrastructure, um, you know, cyber hacks or cyber diplomacy between nation states, these are huge issues that will only become more important. So I encourage everyone to know a little cyber hygiene incorporate it cyber into your hygiene. life cyber hi it's like I washing like it. your hands you know like changing your password every i i would do every week but maybe like once a month is good enough right and so um being up to date and protecting yourself and and that's important and that's what we we have to do in order to move the industry forward in a positive way hopefully we won't be having hacking, you know, hacks every every other day in the future, but that could be a possibility. So, so if I stop doing this podcast, would I be cyber distancing? You would be, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, you definitely. It, it's impossible to live life right now without your phone or be a part of the society. You know, engaging. And, and releasing your information. It's impossible not to. I'm not suggesting you go lock yourself into a cave and like <laughs> just give up everything. I mean, sometimes I want to do this, but. <laughs> I respect the PR on my bad dad joke. It's greatly appreciated. <laughs> so yeah. besides my change in sense of humor, here's an important question I like to ask all of my guests on this one. What's the biggest change do you want to see for yourself in 2021? 
Wow, I've had so much time to think about this one. And basically because of the pandemic, right? It's really nice to the world have the world stop for a little bit, you know, and sit down and reflect and say, you know, what is going good in my life? You know, what's not going so great in my life? And what are the ways that I can change this? Or, you know, after after we're released from our houses <laughs> back into the world, how can I be a better version of myself? And, um, you know, I ask these questions almost daily because I'm constantly evolving as a human being. I'm constantly changing. Change is so healthy. Change is good. It's hard, but it's so good for you. And, and that's what's really beautiful about being a human being because we're constantly changing and we don't know how or when or what or why, but we do change and there's, we have no choice but to change, to adapt and survive in the world. So for me, I'm, I'm interested in taking different disciplines and adapting them to cybersecurity. Um, that's what's interesting for me, for my career and moving forward. For myself, uh, this pandemic has made me more empathetic uh, and really understand my coworkers and them, you know, having five children running around or, um, you know, trying to figure out where in their house they can work, where their spouse can also, you know, take all the same time. And and um, I want to increase this, this reciprocity and of empathy. I think this is so important and it's really keeping, you know, teams together at work. It's keeping all of us connected and safe. And um, for me, that's a personal goal is to continue this positive uh, empathy, especially during the pandemic. And, and we can carry this into, the non-pandemic years as well. You know, it's not just something that has to happen now. Well, ultimately, we're as good as as much as that we push each other. And that's ultimately what the Change Within Podcast is about. For those who don't listen to us typically, but who want to, you can find the Change Within Podcast on Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Alicia, thank you very much for joining the podcast for today and have a great rest of your night. You're welcome. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Absolutely. Have a good, Have a good night.